Good morning, all. Um, Dennis has a nasty cough, so I'm going to go through the very beginning of this and then pass it along to the people who do the real work. Um, so welcome to Sprint 127 Review. This was another four-week sprint because we had shut down. Um, so statistics and so forth might be a little skewed going on. Um, I will go through um, quickly the sprint statistics that we have. Then Carol will take over with community update. Uh, Harpreet will give us uh, the latest on the UI. Adam for providers. Um, hopefully Tina's feeling well enough to do automate. Joe V um, on platform. Martin P for API and Mike for QE. All righty, um, so just briefly, you can see on this screen, we merged 331 PRs across the repos. Um, on, opened, we currently have opened 351. Um, the number of PRs still open is 374. Um, by label, uh, you can see here that we had, oh boy, sorry about the phone. You can see that we pretty much are um, equally distributed across technical debt um, enhancements and bugs with a few other things. I would like to point out that um, I'm, I'm no longer including in the statistics archived and forked repos. So that actually brought down the number of repos we're looking at from 165 to 115, something like that. So I thought you'd all want to be aware. Um, and lastly, here is our uh, repository health report for just a smattering of repos. Um, not a lot of change except for that VMware, um, not looking so good. So we'll have to see what's going on with that. And with that, I will turn over to Carol. All right, thanks, Marianne. Um, Happy New Year, everyone. So for the first Sprint this year or decade, <laughs> we have um, the uh, Manage IQ Ivan Shuk 2 release. So it's the first update since the GA. Um, and uh, we also have um, uh, Nick added the mention uh, in the Getting Started documentation uh, to the Manage IQ Pods project, which um, contains uh, instructions and, and scripts for running Manage IQ as a set of containers, so the podified version. Uh, in Kubernetes or OpenShift. So that's added to the documentation. And um, that's all for this update. Thanks, and next slide, please, to Harpreet. Thanks, Carol. Hello, everyone. Total of 70 PRs merged across the UI repos. That includes three enhancements, 15 bug fixes, 41 technical debt-related PRs that mainly address Rubocop warnings. And um, for the bug fixes in this print, group edit screen was fixed to prevent rendering of US user to look up form field twice that had some same DOM ID that was causing some anomalies in the form. Um, a fix was made to display cancel button on non-explorer type compare screens so user can easily return back to the previous screen. Um, Code was fixed um, in the when creating a new generic object playbook custom button. Code expected um, service template ID to be included in the AE attributes hash, so um, it was not being passed in, so it was not saving the service template uh, information in the object. So that was fixed, and um, there were several PRs that address issues with trying to perform different tasks on list of instances when drilling to those from other screens through relationships. So I have uh, listed all the PRs that uh, are related to the, that fix. Um, formatting on the automate entry point model was fixed to allow user to scroll through items when there are a lot of nodes in the tree. And uh, finally, code that used to generate API token for UI was deleted during a cleanup effort, but uh, it turned out that we needed that for a cockpit web console button to work, so that got fixed. And uh, for the enhancements, I have screenshots, so uh, next screen, please. In the toolbars, a configuration option was added to allow admins to set a parameter 
custom button count in advanced con config, as you can see on the left side of the screenshot, that calculates how many custom buttons, um, custom button groups should be displayed normally before rest of the buttons are compacted and displayed as a kebab menu. Default value is set to show three expanded and the uh, rest of them in the kebab menu, but that can be changed as you can see in this screenshot, uh, we are saving two custom button count and on the right you can see the two of the custom button groups are shown as expanded and rest of the buttons are in that uh, kebab menu on the uh, right. Next slide please. And in the automate side the method editor was uh, updated to when adding the workflow or job template workflow type uh, methods there was a few extra fields added posts and input parameters as you can see in the screenshot and that's all we have for the UI over to Adam. Thanks Harpreet. Uh, so pretty exciting sprint for providers. So uh, Oleg was working on extracting a bunch of provider specific code from the core VM scan class which is what does the actual smart state uh, scans. So in there there's a whole bunch of if conditionals or saying if it's this or this or this and, and you can see my, my personal favorite conditional that it was removed. I still don't understand exactly how it was going to work. But um, so what he did was he split out all of that and subclassed the VM scan into the different provider repos. So the core VM scan just deals with uh, the, the core stuff of taking the data in an XML format that it got back from the provider saving it to the database, synchronizing it, all that. The actual work of creating snapshots and, and dealing with talking to the provider is all moved out into the provider repo. So, you know, that cleaned up a lot of these conditionals the way that they properly should be. So that was a really great change. Um, Jason fixed, not fixed. So uh, in MIQ server, since MIQ server does the actual fixed disk lib communication to talk to a VMware disk um, as part of the smart proxy work, it had a reference to the core, uh, or sorry, to the VMware Web Service gem to actually see if that library was available. Um, we've been trying to move any references to the Vim broker out of core, and so he moved how we're actually setting the has vix disk lib column of MIQ server out into the VMware plugin. Uh, so the way he did this was in a gener uh, generic way, allowing plugins to bring their own seed classes, and so. Uh, at, at startup when we seed everything, it also looks to the plugins now to see if they have anything to seed. And VMware happens to be the first plugin that brought a seedable class, which checks if the VIX disk lib library is there for the VDDK and populates the MIQ column. Um, so it's a cleaner way of, of achieving that and also opens up fun functionality for other providers in the future to plug into this new seedable classes uh, framework. Next slide. Uh, I went through and subclassed all the EMS folders. So before there were just uh, the EMS folders base class, data centers, and storage clusters. We've been trying to move all the provider specific logic out of those types of base classes and into provider specific ones. So all the providers, mainly the infra providers that had instances of, of EMS folders, they have their own subclass. So just like there's a you know, VMware Infra Manager host that derives from the base host class. Now there's a folder, a data center, a storage cluster, et cetera. Um, that allowed us to move a, a number of uh, mainly pro uh, VMware provider specific code out of core and into the VMware provider. Um, there's a, a full class hierarchy of how that, uh, how that went in, the, in that main PR. Um, there's also a schema change to update existing databases, obviously, to, to subclass them properly. Uh, Keenan had another change in his ongoing metrics journey to subclass the base manager metrics capture. So there was some logic in there which would basically say, if it's a if it's an infra provider, go and do the infra targets. If it's a cloud provider, do the cloud targets. He split that up into cloud manager, infra manager metrics capture classes, uh, and got rid of that base conditional, which is awesome. Uh, this was a big one. So. Before, uh, we had storages that were unique on their location, which uh, particularly for NFS, it was the mount point. So, you know, the NFS server IP address and then the, the path on the NFS server. This allowed for the possibility that multiple providers could be using the same storage record. And that caused all kinds of headaches because 
there are a few properties of the storage which weren't actually unique then because you could name the storage two different things and two different providers. So refresh would go and it would change the name every other refresh. It would actually change the EMS ref, which, you know, if you're talking to the provider, you need to know the EMS ref to be able to reference it. So it caused all kinds of headaches. So now uh, we split it up so that there's a unique storage per EMS ref. So it's similar to all the other types of, of uh, infrastructure inventory. Uh, and also subclassed it uh, similar to the EMS folders. So every provider has their own storage subclass if they use storages. Um, there are a bunch of issues that we had to work around that this cleaned up, a bunch of bugs that we couldn't fix until we fixed this one. Um, so those are all linked in that PR as well, but that was a nice, a nice one to finally get done. Next slide. Okay, so also continuing the ongoing work to get rid of the, uh, the VIM broker worker, we added an operations worker for VMware. What that does is instead of every generic worker running EMS operations roles, Dan Berger went through and added a queue name to all of the EMS operations role queues. Uh, so this is now a worker which will dequeue on that queue name. And what it does is it runs all of the EMS operations work. And that allows it to share a VMware session within that worker, which is essentially what the VIM broker was accomplishing, but it had to do it over DRB because it was in a different process. Um, that's problematic for certain deployments, like in containers, you can't use DRB between pods. And so this is one of the first uh, efforts completed to actually get rid of using uh, DRB between the VMware workers. Um, so there's a long list of methods that we had to update uh, for that EMS operations role, and that's all in that, uh, that one issue, 484. Um, and so now we have a, a new operations worker for VMware. We'll probably go through the rest of the providers and add one just to you know, maintain consistency, but this is the first one that we had to have. Um, made some changes, minor changes, to accommodate newer uh, VMware GEM SDK versions. Uh, they removed some properties that were deprecated for a while, and so we had to remove those from the spec tests. Um, we had a community user actually uh, contribute a fix when you reconfigure a VM to connect an ISO to a CD-ROM drive. It didn't have the connect on startup property set, and so he added that. So now when you reconfigure it on startup, it'll actually connect the ISO. That was a really nice change. And this is a huge one. So a few sprints ago, we made streaming refresh the default. Um, now streaming refresh is the only uh, refresh option for VMware. So uh, we were able to completely remove uh, a couple of workers. That core refresh worker was basically kind of a workaround for how slow refresh was. It would basically say, use the updates directly to update things like the VM power state and the VM IP address. Uh, we don't need that anymore because all of the refreshes are essentially doing it that, that way. Um, we maintain the common EMS refresh dot refresh functionality. So if you're a developer and you just want to quickly get something up to date, that still works, uh, even though it's not using the, the old code. And DRB and the VIM broker are no longer needed for VMware refreshes, which is huge. Um, and then we also obviously deleted a whole bunch of code. So most of those right now are spec tests because there's still some parts in the main refresh parsers that are used, which is why the, the test coverage went down because there's a bunch of dead code that's not actually called, but it's still there until I go back and clean, clear it all up, but the specs were removed. Um, and then on the next slide, there's a, a, a nice video demo. I did this a lot, like many, probably years ago, um, showing what streaming refresh can do. Um, but to understand that, it helps to know kind of how refresh today works. So right now, there's an update-driven loop in the VIM broker, which updates the cache. And then on the side, an event is also raised, and it's caught by the event catcher, which then goes to the MIQ queue, which goes to the event handler, which goes to automate to figure out that you need to queue a refresh, which goes back to MIQ queue, then to the refresh worker, which then asks the VIM broker for the cache. So it's this kind of big, whooping, mm -hmm. Thing to actually get something to be asked to be refreshed. And if we go to the next slide, we can see what the new method looks like. Um, so this has been in for a couple, maybe a year or two as an option, a prototype. Uh, now it is the only way. So we're looking at a vCenter here. <clears throat> and what I'm going to do is using the run single worker script, I'm going to just run just the refresh worker. 
So before refresh wouldn't work if you didn't have all of those things working. You know, if you didn't have an event catcher, it wouldn't pick up on new changes here. All you need is the refresh worker. Uh, so if we go to the logs, that's the normal worker startup, uh, checking the authentication. And here it actually just did the first, it's starting the first refresh now. And it's done. Um, so it's relatively small VC, so that's not a big deal. But the, the first refresh is pretty quick, even on you know 10 or 20,000 VM environments. So what I'm going to do is show uh, making a small change on the VM, VMware side and seeing how quickly it gets picked up. So I'm going to create a test folder here. Uh, did this one, so hopefully I knew the name already. So it's already done. So the new method, instead of updating the cache and raising events and all that, it basically takes the update, parses it, and saves it directly to the database. Um, and that was just deleting the folder, and it's gone already. So it's, it's almost instantaneous getting uh, new changes in. So now I'm going to show creating a new VM. Uh, there's some other stuff going on in the background, but we got a test VM here that we're going to go through. None of this matters. None of this matters. Oh, this matters a lot, not Windows. Um, OS latest. All right. So now we're going to create the VM. And if we go over to the other side, oh, yeah, I want to be able to see what changed. Um, so the VM's already in the database now. So it's near instantaneous, near real time. Um, so if we go over and just check the database to make sure it's there, just to prove that, you know, hey, it worked fine by. And that took longer to look it up in the database than I think the refresh took. Um, so there it is. So, you know, everything essentially now is, is a targeted refresh, where before, if it wasn't one of the host or VM changes, it had to do a full refresh. Now everything is a targeted refresh. Um, so, you know, cluster changes, data center changes, storage changes, everything um, is targeted. So it should increase the performance of the system pretty dramatically. Um, and that's all I got for that. Next slide. Hey, that's awesome, Adam. Thanks so much. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, 24 PRs merged the Sprint. Um, this first change builds on two recent enhancements and works towards the goal of using Ansel playbooks in a state machine without having to use Ruby methods. Previously, Lucy added the ability to set state vars with values defined in the playbook set stats data. Lucy also added the set service var method, which allows users to set values in the root or top level service. Lucy's enhancement builds on this work and allows users to set service vars based on values defined in set stats. Patrick modified the, the service model YAML encoding and, code, and decoding to store just the class and object ID, which is the ID of the backing active rep, record object. Jason created a new console helper method, automate initialize EVM. Uh, the Rails console can be used to test automate code, but requires some setup. This helper method sets up the workspace and sets the admin um, automate user ID. Um, thanks, Jason. It's an awesome change. Um, previously, Lucy added an automate timeout for service provisioning. This sprint, she added code to the service execute provision automate methods for generic and orchestration services to set the automate timeout in the service options hash. Billy made a logging change for service retirement to log the service tasks not yet in the not yet retired in the check service retired automate method. This change will allow users to see the service retirement progression and will help greatly in retirement debugging efforts. Billy merged the Red Hat domain contents into the manage IQ. We'll have more on that in the upcoming sprints. Next slide, please. True, TrueU changed the writable accessible storages method for VMware to exclude storage as a maintenance mode. The, um, the VM prevent policy retirement changes Lucy made recently were backported to Hammer and Ivan Chuck um, releases this sprint. Lucy fixed an issue where the CC and BCC wasn't getting honored by the built-in send, send mail method. Patrick changed the automated import to prevent system domains from being imported, added additional validation, and better uh, enhanced error logging. Finally, Billy fixed a service quote issue where VM memory service dialog element was handled differently depending on the dialog field name. That's it for automate. Next slide and over to Joe. Thank you, Tina. I was having a hard time unmuting. Sorry about that. The 37 PRs were merged across the multiple platform related repos this past sprint. Starting with enhancements, Brandon contributed one to add RubyGem Manage IQ org as a source for gems and updated the dependency on the HandSoap gem accordingly. Jason contributed a new tool to visualize jobs in graphviz.format. 
Dan updated us so that we have a few updates to the um, gem versions. Uh, Dan updated Bundler to version two. Drew, you bumped us to Ruby Zip version two. And Nixie bumped the Linux admin to version two. And Joe R added the sync gem for forward compatibility since it had been removed from the Ruby standard library in version 2.7. For bugs, Nick C fixed a bug where web console access cockpit was not working. And by updating the Manage IQ appliance console to version 5.3, Nick addressed two bugs. One where hardening the appliance using SCAP would fail during configuration, and an RFE re requesting the ability to execute the hardened appliance using SCAP configuration through the um, appliance console CLI. Brandon fixed a bug where multiple pods in Kubernetes namespace were we're sharing the same log stream. And Adam fixed a bug where every metrics collector worker for every EMS type would get started if the role was simply enabled. And Drew Yu addressed a bug where the appliance console was not handling host names that started with an integer. I'm not sure who wants to do that anyway, but now we can. Um, next slide, please. There we go. Okay, on to technical debt. Keenan addressed some by cleaning up nil used in the turn, ternary operator. That's a hard word to say. Uh, Brandon removed references to the no longer used Highline gem. And Nick C did some refactoring to, one, move the important parts of monitoring workers into the monitor workers method. Two, improve when the check for timeout, timed out queue messages was done from the default of every 15 seconds to once every 10 minutes for the entire region. And he split the repository, the responsibilities of the worker heartbeat into separate methods. And he made a change to use term signals to stop workers, which system D and containers both require. And Libor did some refactoring to reduce queries in tag name validation in the classification model. And on to the last slide, please. There we go. So there's a long list of um, test-related, spec-related improvements that uh, Keenan, Lucy, and Dan all contributed this large bunch to uh, our ongoing effort to improve our test coverage. Um, and that's it for the platform space. On to the API and Martin. So on the API side, we had only one significant change in the last sprint, and it was a fix by David, where, so uh, when, it, when you log in to the service UI or any other UI that uses the API, uh, there's, a, there's a AJAC request that fires uh, for the authentication. And if the credentials are wrong, you get a response back that says basic outs is required as HTTP header. So we edit a, a check to see if the request is uh, is coming from a from a cross site request uh, cross um, from the from the AJAX request and in that case we prevent the header from being added meaning there is no pop up in the browser window and that's all I have next slide please. Good morning, everybody, uh, and good afternoon, good evening, I guess, too. Uh, so just a, a quick first slide showing uh, our top uh, number of PRs by label. Uh, so we had a lot of test automation, uh, test fixing and enhancement uh, PRs in the script. Uh, we had a lot of PRs with uh, of labels with a, a couple uh, counts as well, uh, but these are just the, the top ones. And next slide, please. And uh, so uh, I've started going through and closing out some old issues uh, in integration tests. Uh, some of these issues have been closed with actual uh, fixes uh, and some as no longer relevant. Uh, other than that, uh, we had a lot of test contribution uh, and I'll read through some of these uh, uh, summaries. Uh, these are, are by no means uh, all the test contributions uh, or all the contributors. Uh, so. Niaz has automated dynamic service dialog CRUD tests. Uh, Nikhil automated dynamic dialog execution tests. Uh, Yaroslav fixed our subscription tests. Uh, Yevgen made uh, two contributions uh, this time a dummy appliance uh, PyTest sessions now force 
a collection only. So if you don't have an actual appliance to run tests against, uh, then you'll only uh, be running test collection. Uh, and he fixed the alert uh, dismissal behavior for VMRC uh, XDG uh, open dialogues. They were getting uh, dismissed automatically, uh, so we didn't have the chance in the test uh, to look for uh, the new tab appearing uh, and to handle that. Uh, Parthfi added customer scenario tests uh, for service templates, service refresh, and she added REST API entity properties to dialogues, service dialogues, and catalogs, uh, providing a consistent method uh, for us to access the API entity uh, as opposed to the UI entity. Ganesh uh, added domain import export tests uh, to cover overwriting behavior uh, and has been adding uh, additional import uh, branches to our uh, Git import repository. Uh, Yaroslav also added uh, Sprout pull refresh calls uh, to our appliance fixtures that will make sure that appliances given to the PyTest session by Sprout uh, are refreshed before they time out so you don't lose your Sprout appliances in the middle of a test. Uh, he also fixed the log rotate, proxy, and DB restore tests. Uh, Shveta has fixed our migration throttling uh, tests. Satyajit, 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 uh, excuse me, has fixed parameterization on our fixtures uh, for VM and instance smart state tests uh, so that those tests are better parameterized. Uh, John has converted the config manager class to use both base provider and base collection. Uh, this allows the config managers to be treated just like providers uh, for the purposes of test collection and test parameterization. Pause for applause on that one because that was a big effort. And Tassos, well, Tassos. yeah, <laughs> everyone clap for John on that one. Uh, and Tassos has automated our uh, multiple VM retirement tests. So he took the, the VM and instance retirement tests. Uh, and added uh, fixture support and parameterization uh, to do multiple retirement, uh, and also uh, providing methods on the collection classes. Yeah. Uh, and then a link there at the bottom for our tagged release 17.65.0. Thanks, everybody. Fill in for Marianne. Are there any questions or discussions for this sprint? Thanks, Joe. Sorry. Oh, there she is. All righty then. See you guys in a few weeks. <laughs>